I'll be talking for the next half an hour, 40 minutes, about economic and political factors. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be talking about economic and political factors, the publication of translations, uh, and I'm going to begin by some suppositions on economic factors influence, influencing translations, some of which I'll try to reply to, others of which I shall not. Uh, please voice any comments uh, on... No, it's... No, don't voice comments. <laughs> Until after 20 minutes. Don't voice comments. Until after 20, 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. This is for posterity. Interact. It's not interactive. Well, this is technology. It's technology. <laughs> it's interactive right. for the future. It's right. Right. Okay. Please think about making comments <laughs> on the following statements. I'll go through them very slowly. You can note them down. Uh, I'm sure you have ideas on a number of them. We'll come back to them when we are able to. Suppositions on economic factors influencing translation. Uh, if a large part of the population speaks a foreign language, fewer translations will be produced. If a large part of the population speaks a foreign language, fewer translations will, will be produced. Second one, which I'll be looking at a little bit later, high tariffs and economic protection inhibits the flow of translations. High tariffs and economic protection inhibits the flow of translations. Contrasting with this, the EU, European Union, has increased the translation flow. The European Union has increased the translation flow. I don't believe we have anybody here working in the European Union. No. The big world economies dominate the translation flow. I wonder if this is true. The big world economies, which are they? United States, of course. Second now is China already second. Has China overtaken Japan? So it would be uh, United States, Japan, China, Germany, Britain, Italy, Spain, something like that. Do these economies dominate the translation flow? In a booming economy, more translated works will be published and more translation services needed. Seems obvious. I'd just like your comments. If the economy is going well, there is a need for translators and translations. Both interpreters, translation services, books published, etc. The military dictatorship will generally be a poor period for publication and translation. We hear in Spain that certainly the Catalan language uh, went through a very poor period during the Franco dictatorship. We hear that translation has boomed in the post-Franco period and here in Catalonia. A military dictatorship will generally be a poor period for publication and translation. A translated work is a good, just like a household appliance, or rather a record or a DVD. A translated work you buy in a shop is a good, just like another good, a household appliance, or perhaps more like a record or a DVD. A translator or interpreter provides a service, as does an electrician or a plumber, or maybe more a doctor or a dentist. Yeah, I, I see people nodding. Prefer to be compared to a compared to a doctor or a dentist? No, mm -hmm. psychologist rather than an electrician or a plumber. A plumber, hey. Higher literacy rates will increase the number of translations. It's 
seems, again, if we think particularly of literary translations work published, this seems to be obvious. Uh, maybe we can look at some of these points, some of which I'll try to answer to a certain extent, others which I just leave. Government should play an active role in encouraging translations of works representing the national culture. Government should play an active role in encouraging translations of works representing the national culture. Certain governments offer prizes, offer uh, funding for translations. Uh, Ireland is a case here. Should this be the role of the government? A new nation will translate the great works of the world into its language. A new nation will take, translate the great works of the world into its language. And the final one here, nationalistic policies will tend to reduce the number of translation. A government which does not look outside in cultural terms or even economic terms, the obvious result will be a reduction in the number of works coming in from abroad. What do you think of this? Right, I'll now begin on talking about the uh, translation in the period uh, in Brazil, which I'm particularly interested in, which I talked to talked about in other terms uh, earlier, but I'll be concentrating on certain factors of government economic policy and how these affected translation. Brazil before 1930, the economic policy dominated by the Café con Leite, which if you don't know Spanish, I think you can even, if you don't know Spanish you can guess that, coffee with milk. Coffee coming from the state of São Paulo, milk coming from the state of Minas Gerais. Uh, traditionally, the two dominant states who kind of alternated presidents. And coffee was, of course, at this time the most important Brazilian crop, responsible for a in certain years, up to 80% of Brazilian exports. We all know, I mean, the things you traditionally associate with Brazil are <coughs> football, samba, coffee, but I think coffee less and less. <coughs> there are other alternative sources for coffee, Ugandan coffee, Kenyan coffee, Indonesian coffee. Uh, coffee, I think, was the staple of Brazil, certainly the staple export, is less and less. Brazilian exports until 1930 from the turn of the century were dominated by coffee. The dominant eco economic policy was protection of coffee producers, paying coffee producers a minimum price for the coffee uh, 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 regardless of how much coffee was produced. So there would be a, a guarantee that their, that their crop would be bought, leading to overprotection. The 1929 crash reduced the price of coffee by something like, uh, I think it went from kind of 1,000 to 100, by 900%. Now, with, a coffee, with, a, with an economy that depended on exporting coffee to Europe and North America, Coffee was exported, industrialized goods were imported. Industry in Brazil was very little developed until the 1930s. Those who favored this kind of economic protection said that, oh, it is much cheaper for us to import goods from abroad than to produce them ourselves. We will export coffee and we will import relatively cheaply made goods from elsewhere. Uh, this, I think, is kind of a basic element of economic policy, and uh, uh, goods were, uh, uh, fabricated goods were, manufactured goods, sorry, were imported from Europe <coughs> from uh, uh, North America, uh, resulting in lack of interest in reducing, in, in uh, developing Brazilian industry. And of course, those few industrial goods which were uh, produced in Brazil, textiles, for example, books, 
ended up being more expensive than imported goods. Also, the Brazilian currency, the milres, was overvalued. And as we saw now on the handouts, a large number of Portuguese and French books, remember the period 1910s, 1920s, a large number of Portuguese and French books were imported into Brazil. And these books were cheaper <coughs> than books produced in Brazil. Uh, manufacturing a book needs a certain amount of industrial equipment which would have to be produced from abroad. It needs pulp. The misconception is that because uh, Brazil has a lot of trees, there should be a lot of paper in Brazil. That is not exactly true. The manufacturing process needs expensive equipment to transform trees into paper, which had to be imported from Europe, from North America. And there were few incentives for Brazilian books. Montero Lobato perhaps was the first real Brazilian publisher who began to develop the book market. So what I'm saying then here is that books were very much an industrial good that uh, were not developed and produced or produced to a very limited extent until the 1930s. After the nationalist revolution of 1930, headed by Getúlio Vargas, protection was taken away from the coffee producers. The currency the meal haste was devalued. Tariffs were placed on imported goods, including books. The economic policy attempted to develop national industry in Brazil, reduce, uh, uh, resulting in the growth of middle and lower middle classes, the government great great emphasis to the production of school books and as a result books produced in Brazil now became cheaper than those imported from France and Brazil. As a result Brazilian books were exported to Portugal for the first time as we saw on the paper the handout there and fewer books were imported from France, from Portugal. A large number of Brazilian publishers were set up. Names I give here, Globo Saraiva, José Olimpio Martins. I mentioned some of them in the article. And a large number of series for different markets were set up. Uh, collections, and of course the important thing about a collection is that you buy one, you buy the next, you buy the next. And they also order knowledge. Hollywood Times, Cheap editions, book club editions, the Club of the Livre, 1942. Translations. Translations were a major factor in the growth of the different uh, uh, new publishers. Translations sold very well. English became the major foreign language in Brazil. Copyright, on many occasions, was not obeyed and royalties not paid. Again, international copyright at this time existed, but, but it certainly Brazil was not followed, not obeyed. So, large number of publishing companies were set up who to a great extent used, and used translation and published translations. Well, we can see that the actual picture is not as simple as it may seem, Montero Mubato, who of course I talked about this morning, uh, the major Brazilian publisher of this time, wanted low tariffs on imported paper. Why? Because imported paper was better quality than Brazilian paper. Uh, Brazilian paper would mess up and stop all the printing machinery because it was such poor quality but he wanted high tariffs on imported books. So he wanted the best of both worlds. Uh, but high tariffs kept both on paper and books. Well, this then is the uh, uh, 
situation that led to, if we just look, look go through something, uh, a, a reversal in economic policy, which led to a rapid increase in Brazilian book market, in which translations play a major role. After the Second World War, there was a reversal with the 1946-50 government of Gaspar Dutra, reducing tariffs again, lowering tariffs on imported books. On some occasions there was a special book rate which was lower than the official exchange rate, resulting in a poor period for publishing companies. So what am I trying to show here? I'm trying to show a relationship between high tariff, tariff barriers, and uh, production of books and translations. I'm trying to show that at least in this particular case in Brazil, there was a direct relationship between uh, tariff barriers and production of books, production of translations. I would also like to look at the period of the military dictatorship in Brazil, 1964 to 89. I think I mentioned this morning that the toughest years of the dictatorship were from the end of 1968 to 75, 76. The economic miracle also took place in the book market. There was a considerable growth in the number of books published in Brazil. In 1960, 0.5 books per inhabitant were published. In 1980, two books per inhabitant were published. So quite a big rise here. And as we saw on the handout just now, uh, this would be not different books, this would be the total number of books published in Brazil. As we saw on the handout now, uh, an American, North American dominance of the foreign book market. I think you remember from the handout we looked at that up, up I think 1970, something like 50% of all books imported from Brazil came from the United States. In addition to those books which were imported from the United States, the US aid, the US, the US government program, financed a large number of Brazilian textbooks. McGraw-Hill was one of the key uh, publishers, uh, which were the key English language publishers, which published a large number of business, economics, medicine, engineering books in Portuguese translated from English, uh, subsidized by the USA uh, Information here. Uh, the MEC Ministry of Education, Snell USA Treaty for Cooperation, signed technical, sorry, for Cooperation for Technical, Scientific, and Educational Publications on 6th of January 1967, when the Brazilian publishing market was flooded with publications of American writers, i.e., exactly when the diffusion of these works became object of the public policy Brazilian government. According to this treaty, 51 million translations of books originally published in the U.S would be used in the Brazilian school system in a period of three years beginning in 1967. While MEC and SNELL, National Union of Book Publishers, carried out the policy, the USA, the US, United States Agency for International Development personnel kept control of the technical details of the manufacture of the books, like the production, illustrations, editing, and distribution, besides the supervision of the process of acquisition or copyright. So I think you can see that from this is taken out of an article by a student of mine, Irene Hirsch, who uh, suggests that very much the United States was very much in control of a large part of the book market, particularly with technical and scientific books in Brazil in the, 19, the, the second part of the 1960s. However, during the same period, and I think we can go back here to even Zohar and his idea of a polysystem, which should be very familiar to you all, I'm sure, that although we find American books dominating a large part of the system, the system, the book publishing system in Brazil, we can find uh, uh, poets, translators, writers who were against the 
military dictatorship, using American writers, particularly certain American poets, as a form of protest. So we say here that American literature was both occupying a conservative and a, a, a contesting role in the Brazilian literary system, literary policy system. A large number of American poets were published in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Initially, modernist poets such as Marion Moore, William Carlos Williams, and Ezra Pound, but also the beat poets and writers such as Allen Ginsberg, Charles Bukowski, Lawrence Ferlinghetti, and Gregory Corson. Ezra Pound was a mentor to our old one and Augusto de Campos, who I'm sure you've met, heard of, yeah? and Augusto de Campos translated John Cage. Uh, so, American literature, American poetry, and American avant-garde literature and poetry was translated by totally, in a totally different sector of society to the uh, books which were published by the USA. Well, element of security. I think translation can provide a certain, can play a certain role here. In the 19th, end of the 1930s, there was the chance that Brazil would enter the Second World War on the side of the Axis powers. Sorry, that's wrong. Uh, policy powers. Getúlio Vargas, as I think I mentioned this morning, had sympathy for Mussolini. Roosevelt, in the United States, started up a good neighbor policy to Brazil. Part of this was Zé Carioca. You can see talking to Donald Duck there. Zé Carioca is a parrot, Brazilian parrot, very sociable, like this. Walt Disney introduced Zé Carioca in order to make Brazil and Brazilians simpaticos, attractive, friendly, to, to give a nice image, to a nice popular image in the United States. And of course, I cannot fail to mention Carmen Miranda. <laughs> Enormously popular in the States, the end of the 30s, the beginning of the 40s. On a more academic and intellectual level, we can talk about this very well-known book, Rebellion in the Backlands, by Euclides da Cunha, translated, you can just see it here, by Samuel Putnam well-known translator from Portuguese, from Spanish, he translates some of George Amado as well. His introduction, uh, uh, Cristo Cunha Rebellion in the background, in the backlands, is about a rebellion by religious fanatics uh, at the turn of the century, 19th to 20th century, uh, which became, which was finally put down by the Republican forces. And the introduction again tries this, this Framing we find in the introduction by Samuel Putnam makes parallels with the, with the position of the North American Indians, tries to familiarize, I think in this case, a more academic, intellectual, highbrow market with Brazil, saying Brazil has a lot of, lot of uh, uh, parallels to the states. We should look at Brazil, support Brazil. We should be careful Brazil doesn't go on to the side of the Axis powers, or at least one reads between the lines. So in the uh, security policy in the United States, the Boa Vizinhança, the good neighbor policy, it seemed that translation had a definite role to play. Uh, also, Gilberto Freire, a very important historian and sociologist, his Brazil and interpretation was published in 1945. And his other work, Casa Grande, sings out the masters and the slaves, published in 46. So, just to sum up what I've been saying in the last 40, 45 minutes, a certain number of discussion points here. 
uh, again, trying to be a contemporary, trying to be even trendy here. Lack of knowledge of Iraq in Britain and the United States. Lack of works about on Iraq, translations from works published in Iraq. This perhaps can be contrasted with the good neighbor policy we find at the time of the Second World War. Translations from, of course the situation is rather different, but translations from Portuguese around the time of the Second World War maybe helped Americans to understand a little bit about Brazil, contrasting perhaps with the situation in Iraq. My study a bit earlier looked at the specificities of the Brazil case. Of course, the case in Brazil was affected by available translations from Portugal. Mm -hmm. I would suggest that this is the point we were talking about a little bit earlier, mm -hmm. that perhaps today, as at that time there were a few differences between Brazilian and Luso Portuguese, uh, I would suggest that today this, uh, 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 a lack or cheap Brazilian cheap books available in Portugal would not be as popular as they were at that time. Of course, now this doesn't apply at a particular moment because books here, the euro is so high. But I think a flooding the Brazilian market with cheap Portuguese books would not have the effect it did at that time. They would not be acceptable. Mm -hmm. Um, going back perhaps to some of the ideas we looked at, I presented at the beginning, translation and literacy, parallels between translation and literacy. Are they factors that have uh, an effect? Translation and foreign language learning. I know specifically that Anthony suggests that in many cases it's better to teach people languages than to translate. Translation in the EU. <coughs> translation and war. Anthony himself, I think, did a study on the way translation between French and German was affected by the different wars. The different wars. <laughs> <laughs> Costs of commissioning new translation versus recycling. Different financial economic elements in the particular publishing company of which I think there are uh, uh, almost no studies. The other, the way in which royalties and fees come in. I suggested that one of the ways, on, one of the reasons for the popularity of translated works in the 1930s and 40s in Brazil was the fact that translation, was the fact that royalties and fees were not paid and copyright was not kept 